All right, welcome to a bonus episode of the Blue Oval Podcast. My name is Garrett Zatlin, and yes, there is no Ben today. It's a solo episode. It's a bonus episode, and it's a way for me to get something out there, get some content out there uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I'm extremely busy. Um, I, I'm sure some of you have heard, and we've talked about it on the podcast before, uh, the Strider Report's now back into my own uh, original ownership. We appreciate Streamline Athletes. Ultimately, we decided that it'd be mutually beneficial to part ways, uh, still rooting for them. But now I have the company back. Now I have the business back. And so I've been very busy trying to get a lot of things set up, um, things that you don't really care about. Um, but that's ultimately been why I'm doing this today. Instead of something written, we will have written stuff coming. And then the second part of this is because we have rankings coming. We have rankings coming, uh, individual stuff, hopefully to come in the next week or so, or maybe even sooner than that. That's the goal. And because of how much time and energy and research that takes, that's what my team has been doing. Uh, we want to double check and clarify everything. And so when we do that, uh, you know, that just know that that's what today is being dedicated to. But I also want to do a podcast, just get something out there, make sure we have some analysis and uh, just put it out there for the people to hear. Uh, I wanted to also go over some of the um, – coaching news today and then reserve a few other things for the regular Sunday recording podcast with Ben. And and that's what I'm going to do today. Um, I say 20 minutes. I'm usually always like 30, 40. That's usually how these podcasts go. Um, but we're going to go over, you know, three, you know, major coaching developments, uh, one of which happened today, but all within the past week or so, last few days. And uh, we'll just riff. We'll have fun. Right. Um, so with that, also, by the way, before I begin, uh, ratings and reviews, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, we got one. I'll let Ben read that when we reunite uh, next week. But um, let's talk about some coaching news. The first one uh, that I want to I want to talk about here is Ben Thomas, Ben Thomas to Virginia Tech. My Hokies, yes, are getting their their head coach uh, back or at least actually now this time he's going to be the director in waiting is what I've been told by multiple sources who are familiar with the uh, with the move there. Um, it's an interesting uh, in, intro, reintroduction, I should say, back to Virginia Tech if you're Ben Thomas. Um, from my understanding, he was looking around and heavily interviewing uh, around the country. Um, I've had a variety of different stories told to me in terms of how he ultimately ended up at Virginia Tech. But um, the idea, again, this is just what I've been told, I've not been able to directly confirm this, um, is that he will be the director in waiting and eventually take over the director role when Dave Cianelli retires. For now, he's being uh, categorized into a head coaching role. It's, it's interesting because I think the first thing I think of is, okay, well, first off, Virginia Tech just got a major win. This is a guy with a uh, significant influence in the distance running world. He's highly respected, has the Oregon brand behind him, had significant success at Oregon. And I think he's one of those coaches that even like the more younger uh, crowd, even those high schoolers might know, might have some familiarity with or might have heard his, uh, his name before. Um, I feel like younger athletes nowadays are just they're just more prepared right? They're just, they just kind of have more information in front of them. And so I think they have a better idea of which coaches, um, you know, are kind of headlining the NCAA as of late. Um, but the other thing that I thought was interesting is now that I'm thinking about it even further is, well, okay, but then what happens to coach Eric J? And I'm going to try to get his full name because it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky name. Let me try to find it here. Yeah, here we go. Um, Eric, uh, Johannic, Johannic Meyer, uh, Don, Don Meyer. Um, excuse me, coach. I, I know I'm butchering that name, uh, but Eric J. Uh, he was the assistant distance coach at Virginia Tech. Uh, and then Ben Thomas left. He became the head distance coach at Virginia Tech. Um, and he's done a really good job, like a really nice job. I and mean, there was a time where he had five men run under four minutes, I think in the same race or maybe at the very least same season. One of those guys was unattached. It was Diego Zarate, I believe. He's done a very nice job. I mean, he's taken Nick Plant and Ben Nagel and developed them into instant impact guys this year over 800 meters. He's brought in some really solid names and has developed them extremely well in the middle distances. I think, you know, Peter Sufer thrived in that one year, uh, the first year that Eric J took over as the main distance coach at Virginia Tech. He's a great coach. 
he just is flat out a great coach. And, you know, the women on the middle distance side, same thing. Lindsey Butler has developed into a star. You have uh, Anna Ballo. You have Star Price developing extremely well as of late. Uh, there's been a handful of women. Lauren Berman uh, comes to mind. There's a handful of women like that who have done incredibly well under Eric J. And I, I you know, I, I now wonder, okay, well, what happens now? Because now Thomas is in this director role, right? And it will you will most likely take over the lead distance duties um, at Virginia Tech. And does that mean there's still room for Coach J? Coach Joggenheimer? Johannigmeyer? Sorry. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I it's, it's a very tricky scenario. I mean, it's, it's very similar to what happened to Ben Thomas, right? Where Thomas was the men's assistant distance coach at Oregon. And then Jerry Schumacher comes in. And he's like, no, I got it. I'm good. I'm going to take over. And Thomas is set aside. So it's, I don't know if that's going to happen now. I don't know if that's going to happen at all. I'm just speculating. But we've seen instances like this before. And it would just be almost ironic to try to balance this if you're, you know, Coach Jay in terms of like, well, I just took over for the guy who left and now that same guy's coming back. And now he has to, you know, is he going to move back to the assistant role in a more assistant capacity? Will he look elsewhere? I, I feel like, you know, his services would be used as a coach. You know, they'd be viewed very highly, right? Very favorably. And so I don't know. I don't know. I think it's interesting. Um, as a Virginia Tech guy, I want, you know, accomplished coaches at Virginia Tech, I'm biased. I know. I would, I would hope he stays, and I would hope that nothing, you know, that nothing really logistically changes for him. But it, it will be interesting there. Um, I, I would be monitoring Virginia Tech though from a recruiting standpoint. Um, like I said earlier, I think people know who Ben Thomas is. I think they know what he's done at Oregon. I think they know his background. I think they know that he's a significant name. Um, and, and I think that matters nowadays. I think in, in an era where younger top tier athletes are more involved, more invested and have more information to them, thanks to the Strat report, um, I, I think that matters. And, and I would be very interested to see how on the distance side of things, how does Virginia Tech evolve? Because Virginia Tech has also been an extremely well-rounded program, specifically in the field events. Um, they've had a few, you know, sprints, uh, standouts as well. Um, but, you know, if... Ben Thomas does eventually take over this director role as we suspect that he will. That's the suspicion right now. It's not a hundred percent confirmed, but the idea is that he'll eventually take over um, once the NLRE hires. And if, and when that happens, then what's the roster structure, the scholarship structure of this program going to look like? And I think that's something to really keep in mind. It's something to consider. It's, I, I don't know if we have a clear answer to that yet. I don't think we will for quite some time. So a lot still unknown, a lot of speculating to do. Um, again, want to be clear that he's hired as the head coach, not the director. Multiple sources believe that he'll eventually take over as the director. He's the director in waiting. That's what they believe. We'll see if that happens. I would imagine so. I mean, you don't get hired as a head coach when there's already a director there. That's extremely unusual. Um, so something to consider. But... Uh, I want to move off of that conversation and uh, move to Missouri, which I thought was a little bit of an interesting development there. So Missouri, uh, Lindsay Anderson, who the, was the head distance coach there, she is leaving Missouri uh, this summer to go to Weber State. She was uh, actually an outstanding distance runner for Weber State uh, You know, a few years ago. I want to say this is what, back in 2008, she was an Olympian. Uh, a few years before that, she had been dominating the big sky with Weber State, um, and she was an outstanding distance talent there. Phenomenal. And so naturally, she's going to return to her alma mater, um, and she's going to eventually take over as what the Missouri press release says. Uh, she'll be the head coach in waiting, much like I we think it'll be for, for Thomas, a little bit different. Um, it, they don't specify whether it's men or women, whether it's both, um, uh, the speculation is women, but that's, I, I don't want to put that out there without any firm understanding. Um, so I don't really know that yet, but she's eventually going to move off of there, which is interesting. Um, Missouri is a, you know, it's an SEC program, right? It's one of those things where you, you kind of look at it and you're like, well, that, yeah, that's, it's competitive and I'm sure there's a lot of decent funding and it's not that Weber state's not competitive or anything along those lines, but um, 
just an interesting move. Now, granted, going to your alma mater, I mean, that's something that I would do. Um, but um, just an interesting move, I thought. But more interesting is Kyle Lovermore, who was hired from Georgetown as one of their assistant coaches to then be an assistant distance coach at Missouri. Here's where things get tricky. He the, the press release following um, Lindsey Anderson's uh, uh, you know announced departure. It says that uh, Coach Halter at Missouri will remain as the head coach of track and field and cross country head coach, but the language used in that suggests that Kyle Evermore will be leading that distance group. And frankly, uh, based on the conversations that I've had with sources around the country, uh, specifically one source, the idea is that he will largely be the head coach. It's slightly conflicting with what the press release says. Um, So I just want to be very clear that when I put the language in in the announcement that he has moved into a lead distance coaching role, I didn't necessarily say head coaching role because that part, that specific, the permanence to that, the magnitude of all of that, it's still a little unclear. And so I just want to leave some ambiguity to it and some vagueness just because that's, that's kind of where we're at, right? Um, so I, regardless now, Levermore is going to be able to take over or at least have some significant impact on the direction of this distance program. We'll see what happens. It, it's an interesting program. I mean, they've had, you know, quietly a few sub four minute milers. I believe Marquette Hansen, Martin Padanov, if I'm saying that right. Um, they had a really highly ranked freshman class, TSR number 10, um, back in the, this past winter for their men's freshman class. Uh, Drew Rogers just won the American U25,000 meter title at the USA Championships this past weekend, or last week, I should say. Um, and then Carissa Schweizer is obviously an alum there. I mean, it's been a few years now since she's been there. But it'll be interesting to see what happens and what Levermore can do here. Uh, you know, it's my understanding that he has, you know, if you just look at what he, he was doing and what Georgetown was doing from a recruiting standpoint, um, you know, while while he was there, it, it was successful. They had a lot of nice success there. Um but now the, the direction of this Missouri program is going to be interesting and we'll see what happens, but they've now moved off of multiple coaches in a little over the past year, maybe two years. And it's interesting to see a lot of turnover there um, for a SEC program that, you know, frankly should be a little more stable. Um, and I don't know what the resources are or anything like that. Um, but, but there are moments where there, there's some promise there from, from Missouri it depends on how they invest on the, on the distant side and, and things of that nature, but um, something to keep in mind. Just a, an interesting, I, I thought, shake up within the coaching SEC ranks there. And then I, I want to wrap, and actually this is probably going to be closer to 20 minutes, closer than I thought. Um, today's big announcement, which is Sarah Haveman leaving Illinois for Texas. She was the head distance men's and women's coach at Illinois, but now she'll just be the head women's coach. Um, this follows the departure of Patty, uh, Patty Sue Plummer, the former women's distance coach at Texas. I, I don't have the exact reason why she left. I was told by one person that she retired. I was told by someone else, uh, not particularly. I don't know. I'm not going to speculate. Regardless, she has departed. Sarah Haveman comes in. I cannot begin to express how awesome of a pickup this is for Texas. People know who listen to the podcast, I'm a big Sarah Haveman fan. I think what she did at Illinois is absolutely phenomenal. And for a Texas women's distance program that has very much struggled on the national stage over the last few years, dating back to 2018, 2017, and maybe even before that, this is the coach who can allow them to leverage the resources that they have currently and reach that next level of being truly nationally competitive on the grass I think people forget what she did at Illinois. I mean, she joined Illinois. She became the the head coach there, head distance coach there in 2017. And in 2017 at the Midwest Regional Championships, the Illinois women finished 24th. Not great. Just not. A year later, they finished fourth. Fourth in one year. In one year. The next year, they win the Midwest Regional Team title. They go to Nationals. They finish 22nd overall. The following winter, uh, I believe, it's the winter cross-country season, they qualify, finish 21st. Haven't been back there since, but 
Do, do people understand how hard that is? I mean, that is such an incredible accomplishment. In one year, just turn around the culture, turn around the program, turn around expectations. She brought in a top 10 distance uh, women's distance recruiting class, according to TSR, back in 2021. Um, and oh, by the way, she's responsible for Olivia Howe. The woman who just ran 202 and 433 this uh, over the past two two years, I believe. She just won the indoor mile national title over Lauren Gregory. She's been a three-time All-American in total. She's made appearances within our top 50 individual rankings for cross country. And this really largely happened during uh, Haveman's tenure. And not only that, but uh, Jonathan Davis, who was a longtime veteran of that program. His last year there, last two years, last year, was phenomenal. He was awesome. He looked like a national title contender on a lot of points. And a lot of that, I think, can also be attributed to Haveman as well. That and him staying healthy and a few other things. But um, I think Ben would, would you know, agree with me on this, is that I've been a very big Haveman fan for a while. And I love, love this pickup. I also, personally, and maybe this is just a little conspiracy theory-ish, I also think this was slightly planned out by Texas. I think there's a little bit of tactical hiring going on. Um, if you look, if, if you remember correctly, Olivia Howe, that superstar distance runner who has a year of eligibility left, she's going to be a graduate transfer. She's in the transfer portal right now. And I noticed this a couple days earlier. I should take that back. Mara Beattie, one of our contributors, our D1 women's contributor here at the Stride Report, Mara she likes to do some, you know, following, uh, you know, take a look at people's follows just to see where they could land. Olivia Howe doesn't follow many track and field programs on Instagram. She does for Texas, though. This is a few days ago. This wasn't today when it was announced that Haven was going there. This was a few days, a few days ago. And, and I don't know when she followed her. This could have been from years ago. And maybe this has no connection at all. And it's just a coincidence, right? If I'm Texas and I know that there's a national champion caliber woman in the transfer portal, three seasons of eligibility, and she can help you on the track, especially. And Texas is a program trying to score points on the SEC track and field stage, on the national stage, on the indoor and outdoor ovals. Wouldn't it make sense to bring in the coach who helped Olivia Howe reach that next star level? Now, granted, I think Haveman, regardless of wherever Olivia Howe's going to end up, I think regardless um, that Haveman was the right choice and she should have gotten the job, and I don't know who else was in that application pool, but I, I, you know, I, I think Haveman was very, very, very deserving regardless of, of uh, Howe. But it's something to monitor. It's very interesting. And, you know, I've, you know, I think I'd spoke with Ben about this where we said, well, what's a program like, what's a program that would fit what, how brings to the table? Solid cross country credentials, but a focus on scoring uh, great points on the track and competing for a team that, you know, the, the teams that would want her are teams that would probably want to thrive in all three seasons and put emphasis in all three seasons, specifically titles on the track. And we said Arkansas. But Texas absolutely fits that, that criteria. So uh, I, would, I would check that out. I would, I would just keep a, an eye on that. I'm not reporting anything. I don't have any inside sourcing, none of that, just to be very, very clear. But some, something to watch there. But um, Texas women have not been great on the grass as of late. They just haven't. Um, they've struggled a lot. I think they scored 983 points at the latest 2022 cross-country national meet. That's not good. That's over, well over, I believe, 200 points of the 30th place team. I mean, when you're scaring 1,000 points on the national stage, it's it's not great. It's just not. And they've really struggled on the national stage for the last few years. I mean, they've had multiple last place finishes. Um, and I, I think Haveman is is the perfect one. I mean, she has 
proven experience of taking a team that's been struggling towards the certain end of a, of a spectrum, whether it be regional or national, uh, in this case, regional for Illinois, and taking them to a competitive level where Illinois was definitively better than Texas and frankly has been definitively better for the last few years. And frankly, Texas is in the South Central region. There's no reason why they shouldn't be top two in the region alongside Arkansas. One year Rice got in recently, I believe that was fall 2021, uh, SMU, I think, has you know been a little competitive here or there. Texas A&M has had moments, but no one's really should be challenging Texas. Texas should be definitively locked into that one of those top two spots. And some year, you, most years they advance. Most years it's Texas, almost every year. But that just kind of shows you where, okay, okay, you you get out of the easiest region and you try to get to the national stage. It's not it's not great. The results aren't great. And luckily, I think that's what Haveman brings to the table. I think she will. Um, you know, I, I think she can push this program to be a top 20 program. I do. I don't know if, how quick that's going to happen, but she has a lot of resources and a lot of leverage to work with. Um, she's a great recruiter. We know that. And frankly, I think it's easier to recruit to Texas than Illinois. Just my opinion. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, I'll be interested to see who the next Illinois uh, distance coach is. Um, there's a lot of great candidates for that. Um, I don't know that for sure yet, but uh, but we'll see. So that's all I have on my end. I think 20 minutes, it's rare that I'm this close to what I actually wanted to, how long I actually wanted to speak. Um, but just wanted to give you a, a quick taste of uh, some of the news and some of the analysis that we have uh, now on the site. A lot of news, a lot, a lot of news. And then we're preparing cross-country rankings, preseason rankings, D1, D2, D3. Be patient with us. They're coming. They're coming. And uh, subscribers to the Stride Report will really like that. And they're also, you're going to just really like what's coming up over the next year or so. Uh, we're making some investment um, and, and we're going to we're gonna do some fun stuff. Um, we're going to switch some things around. And, uh, and I'm excited about where, where we're going. And I appreciate everyone's patience as we get there. So that's all I got. Ratings, reviews, subscribe, YouTube. If you're, this is going to be on YouTube, you know, well, at this point you've listened to it. Uh, I'll probably put together some graphics on this. We'll see. Um, but that's all I got. So, uh, until then I will talk to you guys later.